Because I'm using radio mic and I don't trust them one inch, so I'm just going to do a little bit of talking whilst uh, I get ready to make sure that my mic is working properly. Now, we are looking at social media, using social media wisely tonight. And actually, the talk remit goes far beyond just social media. We'll be talking much more broadly about the internet. So, what I want to start with is to get some ideas from you about how you use the internet. So just say anything that comes to mind. How do you use the internet? Oh, and if you're watching online at home, I'm afraid you won't be able to see what I'm writing on the whiteboard, but we hope to take a photo of what's written afterwards and superimpose it on the video. So hopefully you will be able to see it. So, ideas. Yes, Ava? We search stuff and text people. Yep, okay. Text, sorry, what was the first one? Research. Research, Research. yep, great. Research. I apologise for my writing, but I'm not that used to writing on a whiteboard. Can you news? News, yeah. Selfies. Yes. Social media. Social media, yeah. Selfies. Yes. Good <laughs> <laughs> promotion. Yeah. Is it good? Work, Work? yeah, definitely. Uh, right we buy stuff. Yes, great. Oh, oh. <laughs> bye. With you. Sell. And sell. So yeah, in fact, all kinds of business and trade and opening times. Yeah. <laughs> opening times, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so information we'll keep that included in there. Um online learning. Music. Learning music. Learning or music, that's not just learning music. Um, that's interesting. I'm sure there's something that probably a lot of you do and you haven't mentioned yet. Uh, email, yeah. So, um, who to keep in touch with? Family and friends. Family and friends, yeah. So, how do you do that? What's that? What's that? Yeah. Snapchat. Snapchat, yes. Who uses Snapchat again? Snapchat. Only you ever. Oh, that's it. <laughs> you that's good. Snapchat, yes. Facebook. Facebook, yeah. Facebook. Zoom. Zoom, yeah, okay. Instagram. Insta, yeah. Great. Um, YouTube. YouTube, yeah, I'll put that up here. YouTube, oh sorry, hands up, getting a bit funny. Um, yeah, okay, that's great. So, um, what are the advantages of the internet? Instant. Instant, yeah. Great, that's a really good word. Yeah. Ease of communication. Ease of communication, yeah. Sorry, Becca, I'm back to you. Ease of <coughs> Yes, Becky. You can find out mostly a Yeah, yeah. So you don't need big books to carry around. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So again, info, we've got loads of stuff there. Um, what are the disadvantages of the internet? Bullying hacked. Bullying, yeah. Bullying. Definitely, let's put that one. Never get away from it. Yeah, okay, so all consuming. Anything else? What is the false information? Eyesight. Eyesight, that's a good one. Let's put that one. You're friendly. Where am I for that one? You'll see why in a minute. Thank you, really good talk, yes. Brainwashing. Brainwashing, yes, definitely. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. So, yeah, um, health, that's for health, shall we? Mental health. It, health could be bad, could be good, but you can find out good stuff about your health, but you can also damage your health. Great. Now, um, you'll see why I was struggling about where to put some of those things with, if we have the next slide up. Because I've divided all of these into uh, content of the internet, relationships, and time. For the simple reason that the Bible, as you know, doesn't say an awful lot about uh, social media or the internet. It certainly doesn't say anything technical about it. But it does say an awful lot about the sort of content we might be using it for. It says an awful lot about relationships. That's basically the whole Bible, isn't it? And the Bible has a lot to say about our time. So the Bible has a lot to say about social media and about the internet. Basically, anything. Um, you could think of to do with the internet can be fitted into these three categories. So, I'm going to go through these three categories, starting with content, 
and just give you a few thoughts. Here's our Bible verse for this part of the talk. Philippians 4 verse 8, content, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So, I want to look at a couple of positives and a couple of warnings about online content. Here are positives, first of all, and the internet and uh, Christians are not enemies. There's plenty of things online which are true and noble and good and right and pure and lovely. For example, here we go. This is a picture uh, drawn by one of my friends from school on Paint. Do you know Microsoft Paint? And uh, uploaded to social media. And as you can see, it really is quite brilliant. Um, that is just one example of where he's used his God-given creativity uh, to produce something that is really quite amazing. That's a good thing. The internet has a wealth of creativity, as you know, including things that couldn't exist without the internet. And a good example of that is OBS, which is the software that Chris is currently using to record uh, this message. It's the software that we use to stream, live stream the morning service to people's homes. That is what's called open source software. So it means that different contributors can, from all over the world can all come together and create a piece of software. None of that is possible with the, without the internet, and neither is live streaming, of course. Uh, whatever is right, the internet is a great place of uh, charitable work and legitimate business. You've got a picture of a random charity, but in 2013, <coughs> Wired reported that around a quarter of charity donations in the UK are now made online. And I expect since 2013, that figure has probably increased dramatically. So a lot of good things to be done online. Christians can embrace the online world and be thoughtful and prayerful about how to glorify God in that area of life as much as in any other area of life. And that brings me on to the second positive, which is the internet is open to what people make it. So let's make it a place of light and truth. You can't walk around the British Isles, of course, without stumbling across all sorts of different churches. And some of those churches cost huge amounts of money to build. Some of them are extremely beautiful. Um, sadly, they're not always as full as they once were, but they are landmarks that testify to the fact that Christ has been honoured in this country. And if we say, uh, you know, some of them cost the equivalent of millions of pounds to build, so in 1716, St Paul's Cathedral cost over a million pounds to build, which is equivalent to over 170 million pounds today. Imagine the internet being full of landmarks that testify to Christ. Uh, imagine we invested the same kinds of money and time into building these landmarks online as we did into building buildings. Now, I'm not suggesting that we you know, raise 170 million pounds and put it into a website. That would be excessive, but with far less money than that, you can do things that glorify God online. So there are plenty of projects doing this sort of thing. Imagine going on social media and being pointed at, at sort of almost everywhere you look to high quality Christian videos, podcasts, charitable causes, artwork, friendship networks, and so on. It would be uh, quite a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? A lot of people live almost their whole lives online. It's where they keep up with their friends. It's where they discuss ideas and questions. It's where they buy clothes. It's where they buy cars, it's where they buy things for the house, it's where they relax and play games and chat to people. So that being the case, we all know that it's essential for the church to get out there, or, or in there, <laughs> into the computer. So, one of the positives is I want to encourage people who are gifted at using the online world, and maybe some in this room, some watching online, to use it for the Lord. I want to encourage the church to see the value of investing in that world. And we already have, of course, we've got a uh, software and hardware here to live stream. And I'd like to ask you to make it a specific prayer request this week uh, that God will raise up talented people in this area. And that God will enable those talented people to make the internet a, a better place by putting a lot of Christian content out there. And importantly, 
that God will protect those people from the unique temptations and discouragements that come from engaging in the online world. Why not just pray a few of those things now while we remember? Lord God, thank you that the internet is a place of amazing creativity and we just pray that you would use that for your glory. Please raise up people who are talented at using the internet and who are also godly people. And please, Lord, give them wisdom so that they can use those skills for your glory. And please, Lord God, protect them from all of the dangers online. Amen. Amen. That's the positives when it comes to content. I'm sure we can think of plenty more. But let's talk about some negatives, some warnings. Unfortunately, we have to acknowledge the negative content online. And so, here's the first warning. Some content will feed our sinful desires. We all know this, don't we? An obvious one is pornography, and I'm going to talk about that for a second. Jesus said to a group of men, You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I imagine if he'd been talking to boys, women, girls, he'd have included a similar sort of warning. Do not lust, do not create fantasies in your mind. Which means, sadly, a huge, and I say that for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons, a huge part of the internet is off limits if you're a Christian. I say sadly because it's sad that it's on the internet, not it's sad that it's off limits for Christians. The Apostle Paul said, flee from sexual immorality, which might mean giving up a lot of good things on the internet to avoid temptation because it's all too easy to stumble across unhelpful things. And so I thought, I hope this is helpful, I'm going to give you three ways that I protect myself online, uh, which I found made the biggest difference, and hopefully these will help you too. The first thing is to be honest with a friend. Ephesians 5 says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Everything exposed to the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. So, exposing something to the light means not keeping it a secret anymore. So be honest with a friend. And when we do that, there's an interesting promise in this verse. Everything exposed to the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. So you find that when secrets come out into the open, not only are they exposed, but suddenly they start generating light, and good things happen. You've ditched the darkness, and now you can shine out for Christ. So that's the first thing, be honest with a friend. Second thing is get accountability software. I use Accountable to You, this one here, which is also what we use on our church laptops. And the way it works uh, is you download an app onto your laptop or any device, and uh, the app creates a VPN, virtual private network, which means that um, everything you do online goes through that network, and then that network is tracked, and it gets reported back to an accountability partner that you select, okay? So, for example, on our church laptops, Everything that is done online on those two laptops gets reported back to safeguarding at cc-b.uk. That's currently poorly. Or it could be a friend or whoever. It starts at $7 a month. And, you know, I, I suppose you could be thinking, well, oh, that sounds a bit worrying. You know, some person who's controlling this network is watching everything I do online. And yes, that's the point. It means you keep everything squeaky clean. Very easy to use. Now, there's always you know, a way to find that you can get around these sorts of things, but uh, and actually I don't know if that one works on games consoles, because I don't have any games consoles at the moment. But software like this uh, can make a big difference, so it's really good stuff. You can also, I mean, people's online problems might not be limited to pornography, it might be gambling, it might be um, self-harm websites. So with accountability software, you can also put these into the website, and then it will flag up if you're looking at something that you shouldn't be looking at that might not be pornography, it could be all sorts of things. So secondly, get accountability software. And thirdly, find out what your idol is and then repent of it. Or I put on here and talk to God. Now maybe I should have put this first because spiritually I think it makes the biggest difference. By idol,
to. I mean, something that we love and we set our hearts on that is not God and that is not good. So, for porn, that's quite often relationships, could be experience, could be control. For gambling, could be greed. It might be the thrill of it. It might even be a desperate desire for financial security. Something as simple as that can lead people to a gambling addiction. We've got to take these things to God and we have to let God deal with them. And we have to be ready to change. That's a bit oversimplified. We all have tangles of webs of motives and desires and hurts and fears that need unraveling, particularly, you know, maybe there's someone watching this online or in the room who's struggling with self-harm websites or even suicidal websites. Those are obviously very complicated situations. So you've got to start somewhere, and these three places are a good place to start. But if you do have a problem, then don't leave it there. You can get professional help as well. Come and speak to me, and we can talk about where to go. Three ways to protect yourself online. Coming back to content, I was talking about the negatives of content online. And the second thing I want to talk about is that it's easy to forget the truth online. This is Philippians 4 verse 8 again. Whatever is true, think about such things. Now you may remember, no, no maybe not. <laughs> In a sermon I preached on the 20th of September 2000, I, I mentioned that six things, six reasons why it's more likely to be led astray by lies on the internet than we might be in person. And I'm going to quickly remind you of those reasons, not go through the whole sermon again, but first of all, online, you're comfortable. Say you went to a Hindu temple, as I once did as part of my theological training. Um, when you're in a Hindu temple, you feel uncomfortable because it's an unfamiliar environment. You're watching people bringing shopping trolleys of food to present it to the idols. You're watching people praying to these idols all around you. I'm not likely to um, give up my Christian beliefs on the basis of something I've seen in a Hindu, Hindu temple. However, if I'm watching at home, and I'm sitting in my comfy chair, and I'm watching on my phone, which is familiar to me, and I see a Hindu speaking about their way of life, and it seems really appealing, then I might well be tempted to you know, investigate it a little bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more, and suddenly I'm down the rabbit hole, and I'm you know, um, looking at things more deeply. So you're comfortable at home. Be aware of that when you're watching stuff online or reading stuff. Secondly, you're alone a lot of the time at home. So, if uh, you disagree with something that I say, there are lots of people around you on your tables and you can say, I don't think I agree with what Sam said about social media tonight, and people would agree with you and think, yeah, okay, well, we can talk about it. At home, you've got no one to bounce your ideas off. There are no checks and balances. Thirdly, there's so much online. If you read a book, you probably have to spend at least a couple of hours reading it, because it takes a long time to read a book. And whilst you're taking that time, you can think, hmm, not sure about this. But if you're watching a video online, first of all, the video might be over in two minutes. And secondly, it might be one of 20 videos that you've watched that day, or it might be one of 20 pages that you've read that day. And the sheer quantity of material makes it very difficult to filter things. One book usually makes one or two points that you have to agree with or disagree with. 20 articles might make 20 points, and suddenly it's more difficult to process. Fourthly, you've got to ask the question, what are you watching, or what are you reading? Is it an advert? Is it documentary? Is it satire? Is it sarcastic? It can be difficult to tell online. I remember when I was a teenager, there was a Nike advert that was going around. Uh, advertising a pair of trainers, but it just presented itself as a video of teenagers messing around. And they were trying to run on top of the water, and they were saying, we found that we could get three steps on top of the water if we wore these trainers. And, you know, idiots that we were at teenage, in the teenage years, we got sucked in by this, and we were like, hey, that looks, that looks cool. Why don't I didn't actually buy a pair of trainers. But anyway, it was an advert. And nothing on the video said that it was an advert. I think there's now legislation in place, maybe James over there will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's legislation in place that means if something is an advert, you now have to say it's an advert. But back then there wasn't. So we still have to be a bit careful about what we're, what we're making and what we're seeing. Fifthly, um, algorithms, we all sort of have heard the term, if you watch one video which was true or close to the truth, 
but maybe linked to something that's a bit further away and linked to something that's a bit further away, the algorithms will point you in that direction. They'll just feed you more and more stuff, um, similar to what you've watched before. And before you know it, you think that everything online is actually pointing to one conclusion, when in fact, it's just the algorithms have taken you down a rabbit hole and all you're seeing is stuff that's down the rabbit hole. So we know about that. That's the same with um, buying and selling as well. You know, you could buy stuff online and then you'll be fed more of the same. You're like, how many cars do I need? Um, and lastly, FOMO, fear of missing out. In the past, you could only go to five or six churches within easy reach of your house. And now, you could go to a church anywhere in the world, virtually, um, and by virtually I mean online, and you can check it out, and maybe you'll think the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, you know, found sound quite boring recently at Christchurch Bulldog, so I'm going to check out another church, uh, perhaps across the Atlantic. And uh, if you set foot in that church, you would be able to assess it from the people around you, and you know, what they were doing, and maybe the decoration of the room. You'd, you'd be making judgments about all of these sorts of things. But online, you can't make judgments about any of those things. So, six reasons why we're quite likely to stray from the truth online when we might be a bit more cautious in person. And I want to add just one more thing to that, and that is, it's not just words that make us forget the truth online. I was out for dinner with some friends, and we saw a table of girls near us, and honestly, they looked so bored. Um, they looked like they were having a totally miserable time, even though it's quite a nice restaurant and the food was all right. They looked like they had a terrible time. But then the phone came out for a selfie, and they were like, smiles, you know, huge smiles. And I bet that that photo went on social media, and their school friends who weren't there might have looked at it and thought, oh, I was missing out, I missed a really great evening. All well, my friends were out for a meal. But I, can, I could have told those friends, they were having a really miserable time. They were hardly talking to each other. So that photo was not honest, was it? It's actually skewed the truth and made us believe something that is not true. It's the same on the internet as it is with the film and TV industry. You can get a very warped view of what is normal, and we need to be aware of that. Let's move on to relationships, this middle section here. And here's my Bible verse for this part of the talk. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. So obviously, again, huge positives to the online world. It's easy to keep in touch with friends and family. Communities can form around mutual interests. I did a course recently uh, with people from California and Austria and Scotland and a few other places, and our teacher was Israeli, but he was living in the States. And we all got together on Zoom, and I did this course, so it was great. Perhaps also we were more aware than ever of needs around the world. So it's easier to love our neighbor who is abroad because we're more aware of what's happening to that person and it's easier to give to that person. So we can love our neighbors in, say, the East African food crisis just by a few clicks or taps on our phone. Huge positives. But again, let me uh, give you a few warnings about the relationship side of things. The first thing is we need a balance. Sometimes relationships online can be a distraction, we all know this, from our actual relationships. I want to retell you this story of the Good Samaritan. Here we go. This is the story of the Good Samaritan, slightly adapted by Sam. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A Christian minister happened to be going down the same road, but he didn't see the man because he was coordinating a charity donation on his phone, so he passed on the other side. So too, a Christian student, but she was listening to music on her way to a Bible study, so had to rush on on the other side of the road. Finally, a lady who was a convinced atheist saw the man and called an ambulance and made him comfortable until he arrived. So let's not be like the Christians in that story. Let's set a good example of, of balance between our online lives and our lives, our practical care and our practical love for people immediately around us. Second warning, beware the wolves in sheep's clothing. 
You're probably immediately thinking of men who prey on young girls by pretending to be a girl their age. Yep, that's definitely true. Works the other way too. Occasionally women, I don't know, try to add me as a friend on Facebook. And uh, they look very beautiful in their profile picture and I think, yeah, this is a scam. Someone's after my money. The saying, wolf in sheep's clothing, of course, comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about false prophets. People who are teaching lies about God. And one of the ways the New Testament says false prophets will be most effective is through relationships. Made much easier online. So this is 2 Timothy 3. Talks about a particularly evil kind of person. And then says, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women, I'll come back to that, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. It's not saying that women are more gullible than men, they're gullible men too. What it's saying is, these false teachers want to get into the home, and they did that by relationships with the women who were at home. So they found one that was a bit more gullible than the others, and they could take advantage of that person, and they wormed their way into the home, where they could then have maybe a bit of influence over the children, so. And the problem is, in the digital world, they can take advantage of anyone, anywhere in the country, and they can get into the home just like that. So these false prophets are in your home before you know it, and your children are watching false prophets online, or grandchildren, or people you know. Suddenly, these false prophets are in the home. Actually, this is a text that I got Wednesday, the 28th of September. It says, hi, mum. <laughs> yep, know where this is going. Hi, mum, I'm texting you off a friend's phone. I smashed my phone to pieces and their phone is about to die. Can you WhatsApp my new number? And then it says the number, please, X. I was like, well, first of all, I'm not your mum. <laughs> Secondly, I'd have put an apostrophe where it was needed in the word phones. Anyway, um, but someone is trying to worm their way into my home and into my life. And, you know, they're probably after my bank account, but what if they were after Joshua, for example? They're predatory people, aren't they? So beware the wolves. Thirdly, flipping it all of them on its head, beware of self-righteousness. What a beautiful piece of wood you've got there, Sam. Oh, thanks. I was hoping you'd say that. But of course, this is just a cheap piece of chipboard with a veneer of respectability on it. And um, the point is that many of us have this veneer on our lives, don't, they? don't we? we? We cover up our, the fact that underneath there are quite a lot of things that are wrong, really. And uh, quite a lot of things that we're a bit embarrassed about, things we do wrong, ashamed of. We've got this veneer of respectability. And the thing is, we're just as good at doing it online as we are um, in person. And so, you know, I do it by not using social media all that much. That's my veneer. What's your veneer? And the thing is, the problem with this veneer is that when the veneer is gone and we see the chipboard, then sometimes we can get a bit judgmental. In real life, we might be more sympathetic because we know the person, we know they're struggling perhaps, and so we think, oh, you know, um, they've just sworn about their day and they've settled back on the drink again. And if we saw someone in person, we'd be sympathetic, wouldn't we? We'd be loving and caring. But if we saw it on social media, we might think, oh, that person's using some filthy language and they're back on the drink again and all this kind of stuff. And suddenly, we've slipped into a judgmental self-righteousness. Similarly, we might be offended by things like toilet humour on social media or just excessive sharing of life experiences. But some of these things might be a bit more cultural than black and white, right or wrong. We expect others to have the same veneer as us. And when we see on social media that they don't have that veneer, we're offended because we're not like that, but we are, perhaps, underneath. We need to remember that Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. Their social media feeds were full of praise to God, full of lovely things how much they'd appreciated the sermon in synagogue that week. And they looked down on the sinners who posted that they'd had a beep week and were having all sorts of problems, you know, all this kind of stuff. But who did Jesus have more time for? The sinners. So, 
Let's not be like the Pharisees. Time. Let's get to this last one. We didn't have as much to say about time, but obviously, uh, time, well, you know, we could spend all evening talking about that. Psalm 90 verse 12 is my Bible verse for this part of the talk. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, life is short. We need to decide how best to use the time we've got. <coughs> so does the internet save you time or suck up your time? The answer is, it's extremely good at doing both of those things, depending on how you use it. Now, there is some really good advice out there about screen time and achieving a good balance so that you're not wasting time on the internet and you're using it uh, to save time. And I was so tempted to put in some really good advice I found from Harvard Medical School, but I thought we're not just here for good advice, we want to know what the Bible says. So, I want to focus on three ideas from the Bible. First of all, time is a gift. Then seeking God, that takes time. And finally, patience. Time is a gift, hence my overall verse. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The number of our days is set by God, and that is his gift to us, along with lots of other gifts. Time is valuable. And the Bible says we are to treat time as valuable. This is Ephesians 5. It says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. For those of you who like the detail, I just want to go into that little phrase, making the most of every opportunity. It translates two Greek words, the second of which is time, so something time. And the first word carries the idea of buying something up. It's a commercial word. It's the sort of word where, you know, you see something that's valuable, and you see that it's available, and you take advantage of it by buying it up, so that you can perhaps sell it on, or you can make use of it yourself. You buy it all up, you make a profit. And so, the two words are, you buy up the time. You see it's valuable, you see it's available. Buy it up, buy it up. Use it commercially. So, metaphorically, we're a diligent business person and we see that this time is on offer. And we think, I'm not gonna let any of that go to waste. That's too precious to waste, I'm gonna buy it up. Get the picture? And so that has obvious implications for our use of the online world. We mustn't fritter away the precious gift of time by endless scrolling, very easy to do, or hours watching videos just to tickle our curiosity, for example. Let's make good use of our time. Secondly, seeking God takes time. We're all too busy to pray. We're all too busy to read our Bibles. We have to make time for it. Let me read a few Bible verses that I think make the point. Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down, when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord. That's saying, saturate your entire life with God's word and with relationship with God. Otherwise, we might forget the Lord. And how easy is it to forget the Lord when we're on our phones or on our computers? Here's Psalm, Psalm 1. This shows us the kind of devotion that we should give to seeking God. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or take, sorry, in the way sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Again, time given to God. Do you remember Ezra? Read from the law, he stood up. And he read from the law, we read, from daybreak until noon. So, around six hours, let's say. That's a lot of time. It takes time to seek God. And prayer takes time. Daniel, three times a day, got on his knees. Jesus spent all night praying to God. I find my default is much more, I'll go to my phone and check what's on the news, than I will actually plan my time and give time to God. 
So we need to be careful of that. Finally, patience. The speed at which everything happens online makes us forget patience. If we have a problem, we can fix it in 30 seconds. If we want information, we can get it in 30 seconds. If we want to feel good, we can get it online in a few clicks. There was actually an experiment which found that the oxytocin hit that you get from somebody retweeting your tweet is the same as a bride gets on her wedding day. Oxytocin is the brain chemical, of course, that makes you feel good. So why go to all the trouble of having to meet the right person and then planning a wedding and then you get there and you know it's all stressful and uh, then you get a big oxytocin hit when you can just tweet something and the minute somebody retweets it, you get the same feeling. But God's time scale is almost always much, much longer than we would choose. Think of all the Sunday school heroes. Joseph was a slave and in prison for 13 years before he was elevated. Moses, 80 years before he went to Pharaoh. 80 years! David, the king, never got to build Solomon at the temple that Solomon would later build. He wanted to do it all his life, never got to do it. How old was Jesus when he started his ministry? 30 years old. If he'd been an online sort of person, he'd have wanted to have started at 16. But no, he was 30. And after the Apostle Paul was converted, it was three years before he met any of the other Apostles. Can you imagine that now? He'd have been on his phone straight away. Within five minutes of conversion, he'd have chatted to Peter and James and John, but three years. So, God invites us to be patient, he invites us to adopt his time scale, and that will almost always involve us waiting a lot longer than we would like. Galatians 6 verse 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So, obviously a kind of a farming metaphor there, we're sowing, and we're going to wait for the crops to grow. If we patiently sow godly living, and loving our neighbours, and filling our minds with what's true and noble and right, we're sowing these seeds, then God will bless that and our lives will be fruitful or worthwhile. They'll be effective and valuable and meaningful. But the fruit of impatience, just for comparison, is dissatisfaction. Because, you know, oxytocin hits quickly gone, and you have to tweet again so that somebody else shares the tweet, and you can get that same hit again. Impatience, dissatisfaction, confusion about why God seems so distant and inactive if we're impatient, Instant gratification of our desires, which can lead to sin, of course. And ultimately, the fruit of impatience is a life that is not worthwhile, not effective, not valuable, and not meaningful. So, as we use the digital world, let's just keep in mind that God wants us to be patient. Let me wrap all of this up. So we've looked at content, we've looked at relationship, and we've looked at time. And I hope you can see that the Bible has an awful lot to say about the online world. I've probably tried to put too much into this tool. But let me finish with one more thing that I haven't covered yet. And this is a huge thing for the online world and for everyday life. And that is our sense of identity. The online world can shape our identity. We compare ourselves with others. And not just people around us, but people all over the world. How wealthy are they? How good looking are they? Etc. We might pride ourselves in being the best gamer or the best social media influencer. We might embarrass ourselves online. And then our self-esteem in the real world takes a massive hit. Been there. And there are many other ways our identity can be shaped by the online world. But, as Christians, our identity should not be shaped by the online world. And is not shaped by the online world. Our identity is from the God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who saved us. So let me read you some verses about our identity as Christians. This is Ephesians 5. I actually quoted from these verses quite a lot tonight. If you want a go-to chunk of the Bible for social media and the online world, it's Ephesians 5, 8 to 15. Let me read them to you. Talking to Christians, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. 
Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Could have been written yesterday, couldn't it? But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. So, it says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So if you're a Christian, there's been a change. You were darkness, but now you are light. That means that the way you, in this room, Christians watching online, the way we use social media and the internet will be different to the way somebody who is not a Christian uses it, because we are changed people. The changes from darkness, dark, darkness, you get the idea, kind of means stumbling around, we can't really see what we're doing, and we're doing wrong as well at the same time, that's darkness. The changes to light. We see things differently. We do what's right. And we're not just in the light, it says we are the light. Christ says you are the light of the world. Again, that cannot but change the way we use social media and the online world. We are light. Let's be light on the online world as well. And of course it's Jesus that makes the difference. It says you are light in the Lord. The Lord Jesus. So, the relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit is the thing that makes the difference between how we as Christians use the online world and how somebody who is not a Christian uses the online world. And knowing Jesus, of course, means we're a child of God. We're forgiven for all the times we've messed up, including those times online. We've been given a new purpose and direction. We have the hope of eternal life. And we have heaven ahead of us. And I'm just scraping the surface of that verse, of course. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Massive implications. So, the first thing for us to do, of course, is to think, am I really a Christian? And if we are, if we've received that forgiveness from Christ and we've been transformed in our identity, then that will transform how we use the online world. And then when we've got there, we can delve into the Bible and see what it says. A bit more, you know, plenty more to learn about content, relationship, and time, and apply that, not just in day-to-day -day life, but on the online world as well, how we use our phones, tablets, devices, and so on. Let me close there, and let me finish with a prayer, and then I think we're going to pray around tables. Is that right, Chris? Let me uh, pray. Lord God, thank you that your word has so much to say about our lives today. We pray that we would not miss the significance of it. We pray, Lord, that our use of the online world would really be changed as a result of looking at your word. And please may that be a blessing to us, and may it be a great blessing to people around us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.